Go Time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from all around the Go community. Connect with us on the socials. We're on Twitter at GoTimeFM and on Mastodon at GoTime at changelog.social. Thank you to our friends at Fastly. GoTime ships fast globally because Fastly is fast globally. That's how it works. Check them out at Fastly.com. And to fly, deploy your app servers and database close to your users. No ops required. Learn more at fly.io. Okay, here we go. Hi, everyone who is joining us to this episode today about maintaining long-term code bases. And I was looking for people who worked at the same company for a long, long, long time. And not to mention stereotypes too much, but of course, Germany is a great place to find people who are consistently doing the same thing very well, especially in the field of engineering for a long term. So today I am joined by Ole and by Zandor. Hi, how are you doing? Thanks. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to be here. Zander, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course. I'm Shando Such. I work for Zalando since almost 12 years now. And you have the special role of a teapot engineer. I am a teapot engineer. <laughs> yeah, since some years, I'm teapot engineer at LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> yeah. For those who don't know, what is uh, Zalando? Yeah, Zalando is a fashion company, so reseller in Europe. It's the biggest one, I would say, uh, with 50 million active customers. We test with 4 million requests a second to my infrastructure that I own now since five years. And yeah, I work 12 years at Zalando in the infrastructure department. So mostly running the infrastructure and um, Nova Day is the uh, Ingress stack of uh, Zalando. So this is what I'm known for. 12 years works passes definitely as a long term. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Ole, how about yourself? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I kind of missed the point since I have never been working much more than three and a half years or so for the same company. But I've been often working on projects that have been working on by others for like five years or longer and saw what was left behind when other people left a project that has been once a nice greenfield project and now it wasn't so much anymore. And you've done that in all sorts of programming languages like Go. Yeah, mostly Go in the last years, of course, and Java a lot before, um, almost 20 years of Java, and then a little bit of Python and very little JavaScript. We had a, an episode together a couple of months ago where we were ranting about Berlin's past obsession with PHP. <laughs> I'm past that. Yeah. Sander, what uh, languages have you been working with other than Go? So I started with Perl. I learned Java in the university, then took uh, Ruby as the uh, next language. I played around with a lot of languages. And at Zalando, I had to learn Python. So I used uh, to use a lot of Python and took over also the first monitoring system, also written in Python, by a, uh, written by a colleague. So I maintained this also for some years. And yeah, then I, we had a new company layout, let's say it, like this. Uh, we wanted to scale much more and we, we had this radical agility move. And then we could basically change our idea of what we want to use. And then uh, we picked Go. And since then, I stick to Go. So it's like, Five, six, I think six years now. So. so you both have been doing Go for a while. You've been both uh, maintaining code, especially in Go, but not only for a while. So we briefly discussed before beginning the show about the concept of the ship of Theseus. And for those who are not familiar with this term or concept, it's a thought experiment that if you have a boat, and you keep rebuilding it and refreshing it and changing parts. And at some point, not even one part is the same as it was in the original ship. Is it still the same ship? And then we started kind of discussing into how this applies to our world of context. So 
What is your perspective on this? I'm still thinking I'm the same person, even though this uh, all atoms in my body have changed by now since I have been a baby or whatever. Or even the last seven years, right? Yeah, I think it's still the same boat in a way, but it might have evolved quite a lot and not always in a good way, according to my experience. Yeah, so in my experience, it's for the good. So I also think uh, we change a lot and I would rather say it's not a boat, but maybe um, a jet at uh, 2000 kilometer per hour or so. On green fuel. We basically change all the details. And just today I switched to like a very important functionality to use caching on a, one of the highest request per second clusters and it's like all these changes i'm i'm the one that uh, is brave that does the change and executes it and others implement it maybe but i am always like in into the change and yeah i mean it, it saves like 50 percent of the money right now and it's a good change of course <laughs> yeah if you can do such deliberate changes that are really good this is great of course Often changes are called by necessity that some customer needs something quickly and nobody has time for it, but come on, you can do it and it's really worth it. And you will get time later to rebuild it nicely. So just and do it, it somehow now quickly. That's the road to the other side, right? Yeah, in my case, I do a lot of open source and the most important projects are open source. And like we get pull requests and we want to enable everyone to do whatever they want to do with the software, of course. And of course, we cannot have the quality in the pull request normally. It's very hard to get a new contributor up to the quality level that we ourselves want to have. And then we have to like make it better, of course, over the time. And I had an initiative to have like 80% test coverage. And this is my goal. It's not yet finished, but like I have the last module that has only 30% of test coverage that we actually don't use. But I want to make it so good that everything is good and then also switch to this functionality if you need. Because what I see is we get some pull requests and we think mm, maybe we don't need it. But normally, in, like in, in the normal case, it's in one or two years later, then ah, we need exactly this. And this is so great about open source. I think it's also my, my place where how I work and how I can work and for what tools I work, like in infrastructure, is open source. At that scale, I have the time to plan the changes greatly. And it's like if I do an error here and fail in production, this is like everything is good. I cannot do the fast change always. Sometimes I do also fast changes, but it's always tested good enough. I think there are other code bases, other jobs that have like where it's more problematic. Ole, you were mentioning before in our pre-show, or actually at the beginning of the show, that you had to maintain a very old code base. And you did that for maybe three, four years, but the code was there for many years. So it, it is an older code base, and that was not always a good experience. So what's interesting for me to ask you about and to ask Sander about, Sander, did you start everything from scratch there? Or did you also inherit code? And if you did inherit, was it also like for a while around and not that efficient or was it just you know three log lines <laughs> in some testing infrastructure or how are your experiences of that i took over basically all software i take over i'm not the one that starts a lot of projects i mean some yes but normally i take over mm -hmm. like it's a cube ingress aws controller and also skipper was not written by me i only took over and then after some time, I get used to the code and got help to, from the maintainer that has written it before. Now, now I am the longest maintainer of this code base. And also before the Python internal tools, for example, 
Many of them I didn't wrote, but someone is, and I took over. And I think it, right now with Go, I'm more familiar with the testing and how to do things right. And in Python, there was one very, very good engineer, Henning Jacobs. He writes software so fast, incredible. But you can also see why. Like later in the code base, you see how it's evolving. Oh, we have this 20s parameter to a function because we need this little hack here and there. And then we enable this feature. Right? He always adds it there. He has like, he, he works in five minutes, he does it. And then you can think about how to do this better in the next months. Right? So you overall enjoy inheriting projects and kind of improving them for a long term and kind of bringing them to a whole new place. I have to say, it's not a normal kind of joy, right? <laughs> it's often the original maintainer thinks it is just natural and straightforward. It is natural and straightforward according to his own twisted ways of thinking. And as we don't have a very set way of how a software engineer has to think, at least not when implementing business logic or something, this is always different than the next, usually. I, I've never maintained a code base where somebody has been before and thought, oh, this is exactly how I think or something. <laughs> and there are so many ways to twist things and do things differently. These programming languages, you can do anything with them and you can do most things in completely different ways. This is quite interesting and uh, leaves a lot of freedom, but this also makes the maintenance quite challenging. And I think my personal view, a bit more structure will be good in the long run. I think when software engineering evolves, I hope we will get a bit more structure there that uh, we understand better how to write software better and make it easier to main lo maintain long-term. A colleague for me, he says, make it that the code should look like this, that if you come back to it two months later and you need to fix a bug as fast as possible, then it should be written like this. It should be obvious, right? If you do it smart, it's, it's always so complex, even for you, right? To debug a problem, it's like 2x as hard as writing. So if you think it's a smart hack, then maybe you're not smart enough to debug. And this you should always keep in mind. So for your future self, it's better to make the fool, right? To, to, to make it like simple as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, as foolproof as possible. Definitely. And obvious. This is, the, I think, one of the most important things to make things obvious because people don't have much time and they do what's most obvious and natural to them at that time when they are under pressure and can't think about things for a longer time. And then just something happens that uh, does the trick somehow. So what do you both see as the biggest problem? with long-term maintenance of code bases? I think the biggest problem that software project can have is if you build the wrong software, or if you solve the wrong problem in general. But I think for long-term maintainability, you can strike that out. I mean, software that misses the point will one day not get... Doesn't get to live so long, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. You notice after a while. And so this is not the problem for this. But what I see again and again, that you have a mismatch between the way the, the business side or the product side things and how the implementation side things and what is done there. Right? We, as software engineers, we often talk about patterns or whatever, uh, have, have our own language that we use in implementation often. And the business side is talking about workflows or whatever. And then it's sometimes hard to find one thing and the other and relate both sides to each other. And this usually just grows further and further apart. Often the first um, 
the one implementing it uh, says, yeah, I didn't use those words a lot and didn't make it that obvious, but come on, it's just there and it's just a few pieces here and there and it's not so difficult and then the next one doesn't understand it and the next one uh, misunderstands some things too and that grows further and further apart and you need more and more code to get from one side to the other and then the hex get uglier and uglier this is my personal experience You've been working with Ardon Lab since 2019, right? Uh, <laughs> the, I mean, you've been contracting for them for a while. I've been working with them for a while, yeah. yeah. And we recently had an episode with Bill yeah. on yes or no TDD. And then this is very similar to Bill's philosophy, how he introduced it, that uh, to avoid kind of this conflict, exactly as you say, between the ideation part and the implementation part and so on. So he's not a fan of TDD. And he's, how did they call that? PDD, I want to say, like product-driven development, right? That he said, uh, first write the API, have everybody agree on that, and then go ahead and implement that. And uh, I can see how this is kind of a, a very interesting perspective that is not, you know, when you think about code development methods, you do think of TDD as one of the first ones and not necessarily of what you say, but it is actually true that is a big problem. So it's a very interesting listen. We will include a link to that in the show notes as well. Yeah, I think this is um, the right choice. Like API driven, for example, if you I build a new Kubernetes object like the CRD, right? And this is an interface for the developers to use it. And if we change that, you have to stick to it, and right? you cannot easily change it again and again and again and again. No, nobody wants to migrate from one version to the other. It's incredible. Like the work can take one year at least. Yeah? And we don't want to maintain two versions or three years. So we don't want this. So there are library developers, for example, that, that also in open source, in Go, they increase the version so often that you have a moving target, basically. And for example, in Skipper, the Skipper is an HTTP proxy library. So you can write your own proxy with your own functionality and we have a zero version as major so we can change everything anytime but what we keep is the interface for the developer will not change if you do a proxy with skipper it should work since like the last four years at least and we are very strict at this point but in other parts we are not very strict for example we have a net package that uh, has an HTTP client that we think is great. It fixes some problems that we know in the Go standard library and adds some functionality we at Zalando need. And then all the gophers at Zalando, they could just use it and plug it in. This might change more often. Like we added, for example, context and we didn't add a major version. So I agree with the interface, it shouldn't change. You should think about the interface first, agree on an interface that client and everyone can use it, and then stick for it, and then try to do some workarounds to make sure you can add functionality that you forgot, but don't change the interface for the people that don't need it. This we have, we do a lot in Skipper, that we basically... Yeah, do some hoops for us to not break the code from others. Right. I'm more from a business software perspective since I've been working like 90% on business software in my life. And there you don't have this, right? Even the API to the to the clients like HTTP, uh, so JavaScript client usually nowadays, you can change it, right? You just talk to the front-end developer and says, hey, come on, this was stupid, let's change this. And this makes everything easier, of course, but also nobody takes time to think about the interfaces a lot. So you just make it work and you can make it nice and pretty later. <laughs> And this is one of the factors uh, that things grow a bit out of bounds sometimes. Do you see that actually 
you saw oh, this is not nice and everyone agrees it's not nice and hey yeah let's change it make it nice did you saw this sometimes yes it's not that often there are different ways of people who think it's nice also Sometimes you have a team that is split up into like two halves and that they are fighting a little bit. And two or three developers that like clever patterns and read a lot of things, articles, how to implement something in a very performant way and, and whatever. Then other people who think, oh, well, we don't have those performance needs. We don't need this thing. We just want something straightforward that does the trick. And please don't add more complexity. And yeah, and others are so inspired by articles from Google or whatever great companies that solve great problems that most people don't have, but maybe some engineers would like to have since they are good enough to solve those problems too. And they would like to show it. And this, I see some pressure sometimes. There's this over-engineering or CV-driven development or whatever. <laughs> CV-driven development. It can also be, you know, like the challenges you want to solve versus the challenges you need to solve. Yeah, yeah. exactly. What about testing? Like I learned D when I was in like writing Ruby a bit and I saw these test frameworks. I hate them really. Also the Go also has this Omega and so on and Kubernetes uses it. I really don't like it, but a former colleague, he, the, the one that created the creator of Skipper, he was all in DDD. And he is a very good engineer, I have to say. And he showed me how to do BDD. And Skipper code is full of tests that are BDD style. But we don't use the framework. We basically instantiate the proxy, we instantiate the backend, we instantiate one helper thing and here a client. And then we actually execute everything and make sure that all the tests are like running through the proxy. Right? I think this can help like a lot for increasing test coverage, meaningful test coverage. Yeah. And the more you do it, you start also to create packages only for testing. Like we have test packages that helps us to test something. Yeah, I think this is very good. So if you do something that is meaningful, Uh, tests that are meaningful for the product side too, this is usually very good. And they are tend to be much more stable than when you do this just test-driven development where you, for each line that you want to add, do a test case first. And then you sometimes have a test and implementation tightly knit afterwards where you can't change a single line in the resulting code base in the implementation without having to change a test too. And this can be quite awkward. So I love to have tests that are um, meaningful to the product owner and even on detailed stuff. So it can be really down a little function that is doing something very detailed, but hopefully still explainable what this function is doing to someone who knows the product side. And this is really great. If you can do that, I found this very helpful because then you can have meaningful tests and when things change, you can explain what to change and how to change and uh, you can talk to the product side and and don't have this gap between uh, product and implementation so deep so another question to you both when you adopt a project and you kind of lay out your plan on how to start working with it what are the steps and what are the important things that you lay out first for the purpose of long-term maintainability I have no plan. Normally, I just read the code. So I start where it starts, like how it started, how it's 
I start from the beginning, basically, and then I try and... So you go to the very first commit or to the first file in the list? What do you mean? No, no, the main function, and then I start reading from there, and then I start, like, for example, if I have a proxy, then I start reading the proxy package, because it seems to be the most valued one, right? This is the main thing we have to do, so um, what is there, right? And then... After a while, I read this and this and that, and I try to work with the code first before I um, think that I know better. I don't know better. The people that created it, they had their ideas, and maybe they are much better software engineers than me. I, I don't know. Like You also don't know. I, they don't know. You all don't know because the long term, you will see only in the long term. You cannot judge Right? If you start reading the code, you are the newbie. You have no idea. Right? And there are a lot of ideas in this code base. And these are also experienced engineers. I wouldn't say that I'm a super smart developer or so, like, and maybe a great engineer, yeah? but there are also other great engineers. And sometimes I see some quirks, of course. Right? I said, for example, I took over. Uh, code base and then the 20s argument. Okay, these are things you can see and this is like easy to spot. Right? And there are other things that are maybe uh, more important and maybe the code base is good enough for the job. It all depends. Yeah, for me, the approach is so first of all, I have to say that the big problems are way more important than all the small problems. So no amount of clean code will save you when the whole architecture, how all your microservices work together, is completely weird and broken. And you have this star of death or something like that. Then it's useless if all the many, many microservices are beautiful and shiny all by themselves it doesn't help you much and so you have to fix the big problems first and then you can work on the smaller problems and so i start from the, the outer level and go more inside so first is how services are, are cut and working together and then the next step is packages within services so i have a tool for analyzing the package structure the spaghetti analyzer i call it and sometimes you have spaghetti code that you have to analyze and it's interesting of course and with that i can see the package structure in, in a table uh, view and see dependencies, what is a uh, package is using, the other packages and so on. And then I can get some statistics out, uh, this interesting package, how many packages is it using, which ones, how often is it used by which other packages and so on. And so I can find out how things relate to each other without having to read endless lines of code. This is, for me, quite good to get an overview as a start. And then I can work on that and, and get it into a good shape. And if I uh, have done that, yeah, you want to add something? Yeah, I want to add something. So I'm, I'm not reading line by line. Yeah, okay. I scroll the code. Normally, I just scroll. Even if I, if I uh, develop, I mostly scroll code. Okay, reading line by line would be extreme. That's true, yeah. That's for compilers. Yeah, but if you only scroll and you have to pick up some lines for it to be meaningful, of course. The next step usually for me is to make it uh, sure when I have something established, a good structure. Uh, I've got another tool, this uh, spaghetti cutter, it's called. So it keeps things apart and well cut. Is it an open source tool? Yeah, these are both open source. Then we'll add it in the show notes. Of course. And yeah, and this is, uh, you can put a configuration file, can tell which uh, packages should be able to work together and which are not allowed to work together. And there are some defaults to make it uh, a short configuration file and you can override them and that's it. 
And then for me, the next step after that is then really trying to get this business side or product side and implementation match nicely. And often in the things I've been working on, workflows has been a good match. It was all about implementing workflows. So I have an optimized way to do that. So like for almost 10 years, I've been working on different ways how to implement workflows in a way that you have each part is small and maintainable and independent of the others and so on. And you can always do little tweaks and changes easily and put something small in between and all these things. So this is can be very helpful for me. But of course, if you don't have uh, something that looks like a workflow, but quite different in uh, technical domains, then you need something completely different, right? Uh, you can't twist everything and force it into something that it is not. I mean, it, you can, but then you need more and more code to make this gap go away somehow and to bridge it. And I try to avoid that as much as possible. And the last step would be uh, another tool or something to document, to make it obvious what the structure is. And uh, so you can dive into it, preferably with the product side and show them here, yeah, this is the flow we implemented and look, it's exactly what you wanted. And here are these test cases uh, and you, we've talked about this edge case and here you can see it and it's green and so on. And this is the perfect state for me that I like to achieve yeah, for me after reading and creating a little functionality here and there i try to grasp the full architecture and then i start to document if it's not documented i start to document and this helped me a lot i did this like several times now and yeah i think it's a good good approach yeah i agree very sophisticated i have to say this is really good <laughs> If you don't understand the big picture, you have no chance to understand the details. So you both shared an interesting answer kind of to the question, how do you start when you get a new code base? Like, how do you get to grasp it, to understand it, and so on? And maybe the last part of the documentation is a kind of a first step of how to act so what do you do not as a receiving but as a making changes when you start maintaining code so you've improved the documentation a bit do you have some other pattern or checklist or something that or good practice that you do when you go ahead and develop or improve or maintain the code that you have inherited once you've understood it and improved the documentation Oh, of course improving test coverage if necessary mm -hmm. right especially on these levels that are meaningful for the product side and so i have freedom to change implementation details and restructure things internally but still make the implementation do what it should and yeah i think this is of course very important to do this before you do all the changes and make it uh, look nice internally because otherwise you don't have the safety net so for my side I always do clean room first implementation, but never merge like this and start clean room. And then I see, oh no, this is not great. So clean room was actually mentioned in the last show last week, but for those who did not listen, what is clean room? Yeah, you don't care about tests and everything. You just implement in where you are, right? In the code. From scratch. From scratch. Like all you get is kind of you look at the API, copy the API titles, function signatures, and without looking. Exactly. And this is what I most often do, right? Like this, only this, and think how I can make some functionality as simple as possible. And then after dropping the first iteration, basically, I check what do others do. Right? And then I see... Oh, they are also as smart as me, right? They also do this. And then I think, oh, maybe it's the right approach. Maybe I have also other ideas where to put it. And after then, if I think this is good code and so on, then I start to test. And every change comes 
with test and documentation. There's no change that you do that has no documentation. It can be a one-liner fix, okay, then you don't need documentation, but every feature, every change that changes the feature is always also having documentation. Since years now like this, and I think you have to maintain the documentation. This is, I think the worst thing is if you have a split of great code and then there's no documentation, or all documentation is the worst, right? Even if it looks shiny, if it's not good, I see so often in open source, they have documentation how to install the software, and then it has some features, but I don't know the architecture, and they have no picture of the architecture. And then I say, hey, I have now 10 components installed in some Kubernetes cluster with uh, some templating foo, right? That created a lot of things I have no clue about. I don't want to start like this. I have not the time to look at your code base to understand how this works together. Like if you don't add this, then I will never touch your code. Also not use this. I have not the time. I can build it myself faster than, than to get this. At least the functionality I need. And I think this is very important. I can absolutely imagine some AI tool that's coming up that will be just reading all the code and then creating for you the architecture. Just another one add on in the GitHub blanket, please. Yeah, maybe this one. This is a good one. That would be nice, but probably it would be just as easy if it could understand the functionality. It could rewrite it in a clean way also. Mm. Did you mean to drop those three lines into this one? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it will be interesting how will it be for things like Go, where efficiency is not as valued as simplicity. Like you'll have to fine-tune it kind of for the concept of each language. Yeah, it will be interesting to hear back this episode like in five years. <laughs> Go back to this concept. Yeah. yeah, the AI coding world is a little bit conflicted these days. Some people like it, some people not. And uh, there are all sorts of uh, opinions around that. Some are unpopular. I actually think you should probably leave. So now comes the fun part where I'm asking you both if you have an unpopular opinion, what is your unpopular opinion? And then we go and paste it on the social medias and run a poll. Is it actually popular or unpopular? So who would like to start? There's no AI, there's only MA. Okay, okay. Want to elaborate? <laughs> I mean, AI is always, like in people's mind, it's always like something that can think about the problem. And this is actually not true. Yeah? And you always have the MA models that do something magic and so on. Interesting. Yeah. I think the whole AI naming is a bit uh, weird because normal people, like non-engineers, they think computers can think like a brain. And so I would keep it like a bit lower than the excitement always is. I'm, I'm not so excited about all of this. I write my code better myself than than to let them do the code. Like, it's too slow for me to read it later if someone else wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's too slow, yeah. But the thing you said before, that your code is better than the AI code, that can be your second unpopular opinion. <laughs> I wonder, it will be interesting to think, to see how many people think that their code is better versus the AI's code is better. The question is, what is better, right? Yeah, interesting. It's a good one. For who it's better? Yeah, it's also, it's a good question. Define. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, it's better when I have written it because then I, I know it by heart, at least a lot of the parts. And if it's half a year in the future, then you might have some flashback. Yeah. Okay. That's an interesting one. Cool. Let's see how that turns out. <laughs> Ole, how about yourself? Do you have an unpopular opinion? Well, I've got one. I think it's uh, maybe not that much with gophers unpopular, but especially probably with, with managers. So my unpopular 
opinion would be, according to my sometimes very strict definition, when uh, only when you have no gap between product view and implementation view of things. So on you have a greenfield project and everything else is a legacy, then I would estimate that of business software, at least like more than 90% is legacy and there is almost no, no greenfield. So your unpopular opinion is that this greenfield is not a thing almost ever? It is kind of a thing. And it's possible, but almost nobody achieves it. It's a technical possibility that some people have given up to strive for and others say, yeah, we might do this next year. And others don't have an idea where to look for it, even when they they have the feeling that it could be a lot better. And they, I think this is the first step that you need to know what you want to achieve. You want to have everything cleaner, okay, and you can have clean code, which is a lot about details, but there is still something missing, even if you have everything technically according to the clean code book. So if you have to put that into a tweet, <laughs> okay. how would you phrase it? Then I would say much more than 90% of all business software is legacy. And not Greenfield. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Brownfield, whatever you want to call it. Sure is a good episode on the unpopular opinions before all. And we all know that this is the real Hall of Fame here. So cool. <laughs> well, my unpopular opinion is about chocolate. And I think that the best thing you can add to chocolate is not nuts, it's not raisins, it's not cranberries or guarana powder, but it's cornflakes. Cornflakes. And I hope for licorice. No. But okay. <laughs> I hope for salt. No, no. Like, I love salty chocolate. It's so good. <laughs> Salted licorice. This is really great. Yeah, yeah. No. Totally. <laughs> you can add some cornflakes too. Salted licorice with white chocolate or with like dark chocolate? Because salt licorice is just not on my flavor palette anyway. And I cannot yeah, imagine yeah. which of the chocolates would it fit better it, it, with. Normal, the standard milk chocolate. Like standard milk. Yeah, not especially dark, but white might be a bit too much to possible. If anything is an unpopular opinion, this one must win. <laughs> okay, well, that was very interesting. And I learned of a lot of new interesting tools that are open source and are related. So they will be all in our show notes. Thank you for sharing them. And thank you very much for joining. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. That is go time for this week. Thanks for listening. If you dig the show, share it with your friends and colleagues. And if you get a lot of value out of it, return some value with a Changelog++ membership. Ditch the ads, get closer to the metal with bonuses and extended episodes, and directly support GoTime's continued production. Learn more at changelog.com slash plus plus. Thanks once again to our friends at Fastly and Fly for partnering with us to bring you GoTime. Check out what they're up to at Fastly.com and Fly.io. And to our mysterious friend, Breakmaster Cylinder, for keeping our beat supply on and popping. We appreciate you, BMC. Next time on GoTime, Natalie gathers a group of conference organizers to give their best advice on how you can ace that CFP. Stay tuned for that. We'll have it ready for you next week. Mm-hmm.